What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another pool coaching lesson. And as you can see on the screen here, I am rejoined, where is it? Over here, by Nate from the Cue It Up Network now. What is going on, bud? Hello, how's everybody doing? So, Nate, what have you been up to since the Cue It Up podcast has now become the Cue It Up Network? Well, uh, mostly sleeping, uh, <laughs> avoiding any sort of responsibility that requires me to be an adult. Um, what else? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, we have lots of interviews that have been happening. I've been catching up on a lot of the podcasting stuff that I've been, uh, neglecting since doing the battle of the sexes, as well as the women's VG nine. So, uh, getting a lot of stuff caught up, trying to get some more content out. Uh, it's, I mean, it's a really exciting time in pool right now with all the stuff, uh, the matchroom is doing with the whirlpool masters, the whirlpool championships, as well as, you know, the championship league pool and, uh, the world uh yeah the world cup of pool so there's been a lot of really exciting things that have been happening so i'm just trying to keep pace with uh the incredible the incredibly fast pace that uh matchroom is putting out there for us any uh interactions that you're going to be having with matchroom here in the near future well we do have quite a few so uh in the next week i'm hoping well, the, the big show we're going to be having is uh, this coming Monday. Uh, so for full disclosure, I guess this is the 12th. On the 14th, uh, we are going to be bringing on Alvin Ocean to talk about his recent World Pool Championship. Uh, he is now a two-time world champion, and we're going to be talking to him in a live interview. I guess that's going to be about 10 a.m. Central American time, 5 p.m. Central European time. So if you wanted to check in and watch that and watch Elvin Ocean talk about being a two-time world champion, that's going to all happen on the Cue It Up Network page on Facebook and on uh, the YouTube page, the Cue It Up a Billiards podcast. So that's going to be a pretty exciting one. We also have uh, interviews with uh, the Iceman, Meek Imnen, coming up, uh, Emily Frazier. Uh, let's see, Alex Kazakis is going to be joining us. We, if you follow the queued up podcast, we have some really exciting apparel that is dropping very soon. So we're going to be bringing on in the zone to talk about that. And there's going to be a few other people from the industry that we're bringing on. Like, uh, we are pool players and uh, a couple of other smaller entities around the, the pool scene in the next week. So it's going to be a really busy week for the queued up network, but exciting stuff. And pool's growing so i'm happy to be along with it absolutely man it does sound like a pretty busy week you got coming up well thanks for being here for me uh with me for today's um review we're actually going to be watching a gentleman i think his name is Tharan lee i hope i pronounced that correctly and he is going to be playing through three racks of eight ball now the one thing i can immediately point out when we watch this player is that he appears to either be an uh chinese eight ball player or perhaps a schnooker player because you're basically going to see very much fundamental mechanics of how he stands how he holds the cue etc how he strokes the cue ball you know etc etc but what we're going to do here is like we've done before is that we're going to watch through all three of these racks um, nate is going to commentary on the first and third one and i will uh, commentate on the second one but then at the end of each racks we'll go to find key areas in each of the racks where hopefully nate and or i can offer some type of advice to help improve his game so with that being said let's get started well uh, to get started on the first rack, we already see he's messing up because there are stripes on the corners. That is an illegal rack. So everything that happens on this break is going to be completely wiped out. I'm just kidding, but it is it is actually a thing. So we, we got to have the correct rack. Well, maybe, I don't maybe the rules he's playing, it, you don't need to. Yeah, if anything, because most of the videos that I've done here kind of follow the APA format. So all that really matters is that the eight balls in the rack are in the middle of the oh. rack. <laughs> so well i didn't uh, i the, didn't know that so at the at the very least here though because you are talking about the other rule where there has to at least be a solid and a stripe uh in the corners here but nate take it away with the uh the first rack all right let's go so he's got the open bridge so he's definitely uh he's definitely got that chinese eight ball or the snooker background he's got a good cue ball but he's not really trying to crack the rack very hard kind of a I think he only had one ball across the head string, so pretty soft break for an eight ball, but he controlled it well. 
So maybe he's got a ball that, you know, he's got the chalk on the table. That's a, that's an interesting approach. <laughs> I haven't seen that one before. Neither have I. Got a little funny roll out of that five ball right there, too. I think there's maybe a little bit of dried glued in it, that left middle pocket. Now he sets the chalk on the rail, so now I'm even more confused. <laughs> but that's okay. So he's going to take a shot at stripes now. I like the 10 ball. Overran the 11 ball a little bit. Well, quite a bit. So now looking at stripes, his big problem is going to be that 15 ball because it does not look like it passes the two, but it does go into the bottom left. You're going to want to try to get onto that as soon as you can. And he overran that one or he was could have had the opportunity to get onto it. And then the 13 ball is not in a very easy spot either. Or maybe that's the 12. That's the 12 ball, I think. Yeah, the 12 ball. The pink 12. Yes, that's the pink 12. Yeah, because it do, it does go into the top right, but the one and the four ball cover up quite a bit of it, and it does go to the top left, but it's not the easiest shot to get position from unless you're going to play it from the nine. So I'd like to see him just roll this ball in and play the right to or the nine into the right middle, but he ended up going all the way up table. It's okay, but you're running through more traffic this way. So he made it through all of those balls, but you don't always have to. And now he's taking on a pretty tough shot so the the two balls that i said he needed to work on right away are still on the table three shots into the rack one of them is gone now and he he fell pretty nicely onto the nine but you can see that he's he's kind of having to play a little bit more creative of a run out because he left those later on and he's gonna find this gap Ooh, he found it <laughs> that's a pretty dangerous positional shot you could see where he, you could leave that quite a bit short or quite a bit or, you know, a little bit shorter, or a little bit longer. And he's running into the one or the four ball as issues. I kind of like going all the way to the end rail there, winding out the angle. I guess he thought the ball passed the two. Yeah, so now the big problem is going to be the two ball. I like trying to take the three ball right now and going two cushions in between the two and the eight ball and try to get onto that two ball right away. I think that's what he's playing. He checked it up with inside spin instead of going the two rails that that works as well it makes Still the pot a just a little bit harder yeah makes the pot just a little bit harder because you're uh you're introducing some inside spin that you have to control but i like that he got onto that ball right away and i think if he'd have got onto his uh problem balls from the stripes right away he wouldn't have ran into a, an issue and not been able to run out but with the salads he got those out of the way right away so that so him moving that seven ball there kind of makes me think that he probably is a snooker or Chinese eight ball player too because the balls on the rail when you're playing those two games are nearly impossible to actually make. Yeah, with the rounded pocket. So it's yeah. So instead of holding the cue ball there and just shooting the seven ball straight in, he seems to be conditioned to where he has to cannon the balls away from the rails. Though I can point out, because you can't see that this table that he's playing on does not have rounded corners. Yep. This is a standard nine ball pool table. <clears throat> he get, got a little careless with the seven ball to get his cue ball on the rail like that, which made the shot a little bit harder and a little bit less controllable for the one ball. But no issues. He was able to play a good recovery shot. I don't like that he was jacking up there. So that's actually, uh, I'll be coming back to that right away. That'll be the first thing I talk about at the end of this rack. And there you have it. So he had, I believe, four innings at this pool table. And uh, uh, two. Depends. Yeah, it depends on how you yeah. count the innings because in, in APA, I think that would be two because you're just trading between solids and stripes on each of your misses. But. Four being that he took four uh, separate turns uh, to be able to clear yep. the table. You would be correct. Yep. All right. Well, let's jump into some deeper analysis of this rack. All right. So let's get started right here. And this is a mistake that I see a lot of amateurs make. And I, I, I say amateurs, not in like uh, I'm an amateur, right? So I mean like the, the kind of beginner to maybe even some more intermediate players is that they they like to elevate unnecessarily so you can see that he's elevating to get to a center ball hit but if you actually watch the shot at the end of it he's he's basically playing a stun run through shot 
So he's trying to get a little bit extra on the cue ball so he can hit a little bit harder so that he can get the ball really moving down table. But there's there's just no reason to do that. You have plenty of clearance from the rail there. Just shoot it, you know, a tip above center, and you're going to get the same amount of action, but it's going to be easier to control your speed, and it's going to be easier to pot the ball. Everything about the shot becomes easier, and you don't have to worry about, you know, I've seen this happen a lot where if you hit a center ball, uh, you actually stop your cue ball and then you take that eight ball on. It's not a hard eight ball, but the hardest eight ball you're ever going to have if you just shoot it with high ball is, you know, a foot and a half forward, which is basically where you're shooting the shot from anyways. And I'm not sure if we can be able to tell this from our, the angle that we have at this, but uh, Chris, if you could actually play the video here in just a second, when you elevate like this, even if you're using a shooting cue, your cue ball will be leaving the table it absolutely will be off of the table. So now you're you're hitting essentially like a type of jump shot. And if you don't believe me, take a, for this shot right here, set this shot up at your local pool room and actually take a, a key off of, off of your set of keys. I don't have a set of keys in here, but what you can do is literally set a key about four inches away from your object, from your cue ball, uh, in between your object ball and shoot the shot. You will actually see that you will most of the time if you're hitting it at a proper enough speed, you're not going to disturb the key because you're actually in the air. And a lot of players don't realize that the cue ball is off the rail that or off the table that much. So that's one more thing that you have to control by hitting a stun run through on the shot. And we can watch the shot and you can kind of you can kind of tell and see if you can see that it's off the table just a little bit. I doubt we'll be able to because there's quite a bit of elevation here on the camera, but we can take a look at it and you can set this up as an experiment at home and try it out for yourself and see what kind of speed you actually need to get that cue ball up off of the bed of the table and how much it actually gets up. So let's take a look at that shot right now. And, and on top of that, watch the stun run through that he plays. He elevates and hits the center of the cue ball, which basically is going to get you the same exact outcome if you just hit it with the high ball to begin with. So let's see it, Chris. Okay. What I can actually try to do is play this frame by frame just to see if we see the hop that you're talking about. So let's see when he actually tries to strike the ball. This might take a second. See, that's three practice swings, and I, I think here comes the hit. So we can see if it, if it does hop. Right there, you can already see it's starting to come off the yeah. table. Just you can see, you can yeah. see that there is a big gap there. Just and that's, that's not that hard of a shot. I mean, he's not hitting the ball that hard, but you can see that he's got a good – I mean, it looks like there's maybe a half an inch of hop off of that table there. That that happens on every single time that you elevate the cue like that. It just happens at such a small amount, and because you're behind the shot, you can't really see the hop on that. But it does hop up, and you can see it on here. So that's one more thing that you have to control by elevating and striking down on the cue ball like that. There's just no reason to do it on this shot, especially. It's just it's just too routine of a shot. So that'd be my that'd be my big advice for this rack is just get away from doing that. You elevate as a last resort. And that's 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 really on all shots. Okay, cool. I actually have a shot that I want to discuss here, so let's go take a look at that one. Okay, so this is the spot that I actually wanted to comment on, which is the opening shot that he took after the dry break. So with an open table, he decides to try to do a seven. I think that's the five ball, a seven five combination to claim solids, and I can. I can understand why he would want to do that because solids is pretty much out in the open. The only problem that I have is I don't think the three ball is going to pass the chalk, let alone I don't know if it passes the eight ball. I'd be like, what do you think, Nate? I do not think it will pass the chalk. It <laughs> looks like it covers the eight ball, but I don't think he can slide it by that chalk. And whenever you hit a chalk on the table, it does some really weird things. You can ask Max Leshner that if uh, if anybody watches the World Pool Championships. <laughs> But, it's an you know, inside joke to anybody who pays attention. <laughs> yeah, but you know, like if he if he makes this combination, it looks like the seven ball will also be lined up uh, for the same side pocket, and then I think I think the three ball ends up being his key ball that he uses to get position on the eight. But the thing is, is that a combination shot is harder than just a simple shot, which I think he at least has two simple shots. He can either play the ten ball here into the lower right, or he can play the twelve ball into the upper left one or the other so we're talking the comparison between a one ball shot to a pocket versus a combination shot and you can't argue that 
one uh, combination shot is easier unless their a ball is actually sitting in the pocket, which this one isn't. There's some distance that the seven ball has to travel in order to hit the five ball, and then even the five ball has some distance. And then we saw that little funny roll uh, that the uh, side pocket has. It probably, like you said, there's probably some glue uh, still right underneath the, uh, the 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 cloth there that actually caused the five ball to actually kind of rock backwards. But nonetheless, because even later on in the rack, we we heard you comment about how he has to deal with this. Right, because we can see that the 14 ball passes through here, but we don't know what the 15 ball is. And we saw that he tried to play it, but it couldn't go. So that's why, at the very least, at this spot here, I probably would suggest starting with the 12 ball, because then you just allow your cue ball either to bump into the seven or just roll forward to get position on this ball here, and then try to use a little stun left to get this trouble ball out of the way. Because you have to play this, and then you either get position for the 15 to go here or try to get position maybe to go here, one or the other. Because once this area is done, then you just have to pick off the rest in order to try to win the rack. What do you think of that, Nate? Well, so I, I like the first shot of the 12 ball, uh, but what I actually like to do is I like to cannon into that 10 ball there. And then if you take the 10 ball, you notice that that actually clears the pocket for the 15 to go into that right middle as well. Because currently the seven and the 10 ball are covering up the right middle for the 15 ball. Sure. And then all you gotta do is play a stop shot on the 14. So I actually like to cannon into that seven ball, move it over maybe a foot, two foot, even four inches. It doesn't really matter. Just make sure you get a good solid contact, get that 10 ball out of the way. And then basically the 15 ball is no longer a problem because it's just a stop shot on the 14. So now you just got to get good enough on the 14 that you can stop your cue ball. That's, that's what I personally like. Uh, but you know, the 15 ball has a lot of options with where the five ball is. Maybe it even doesn't go into the bottom left. So that makes me want to like to move that seven and the 10 even more, but maybe it still goes by the five. It's kind of hard to tell, but that's, that's kind of my frame of thinking the most natural pocket on the table that I see for it is the right middle with where the 14 is. So if you can make that pocket available, that's, that's the best option I see personally. Oh, cool. That's the whole purpose that we have uh, you on the show. So we can just get a different perspective, but uh, Taron, if I am saying your name correctly, this is all that we really have uh, for this rack here because you played rather well, you know, most of the time when we actually see players play as well as you do uh, most of the time, what we're just going to nitpick is pattern selection. Uh, more than anything else, we can see that you have solid mechanics, um, especially with the open hand bridge. Like I said, probably coming from a Chinese eight ball or maybe even some sort of a snooker background. We can especially see it here because your right leg is straight and your left leg is slightly bent. Uh, so, yeah, um, hopefully this helps you out here, at least in this rack. But let's check out the second rack. And put your chalk on the rail like a civilized human being. <laughs> All right, so here we go with rack two. We can see that Daron is pretty much going to stick with the uh, breaking from the center of the table here. So let's see how this goes. Again, what appeared to be a rather soft break, or I would say softer break because the cue ball didn't pop like it did on uh, the first break here, but he's still getting a rather decent spread for not using a template rack. But the break is dry, and it looks like the only ball he might be able to address is stripes, which is this 11 ball here. Looks like he's going to take and it down. And he's to elevating the... again. Yeah, and he ends up not cutting it enough. So we missed that shot there. So now, still with an open table, I don't know if he's going to try to take stripes again or just go ahead and switch the solids. I think it's a good idea to go ahead and switch the solids at this point. Looks like that's what he does. Okay, good smooth stroke there. Freed up the seven ball, but kind of ties up the six ball unless it goes into the left middle. Going up here for the pink four into the top right. wonder if he's going to try to break out that two ball. Looks like he tried. Probably just want to maybe hit that with a little bit more pace. Okay, coming down here for the one ball. Put a good stroke on that ball. Put a good stroke, but a little too good. Looks like he overran his position. I'm pretty sure he wanted position for the, uh, I think, what is that, the five ball in the middle? But now it looks like he's looking at another combination. Looks like he's going to try to play the 6-7 into the left side pocket. Okay, a miss there. So probably returning back over to stripes. We can see that the... 
12 ball is in trouble. The 15 ball is in trouble. So let's see how he tries to tackle those. Going to start with the 10 ball. Uh, looks like he was trying to draw the ball. And but he did get a great <laughs> break on the 2 ball. Yeah, but he fluked it in. Oh, this is APA rules, right? That's good. Yeah. <laughs> oh, easy game, this. Elevating again. So he, he fluked a 10 ball in and he stays with stripes. So that, like I said, I have to believe that he's playing by uh, APA rules. Is actually with that fluke, this this looks pretty good for stripes. It's definitely one way of getting a breakout on the 12 ball that I didn't see. <laughs> okay, nice. 15 cleared the six for the uh, the bottom left corner. That was a nice stun run through there. Good position on the 11. Just needs to uh, hit the side rail and kind of just roll back towards the middle of the table. Okay, besides the miss, though, I'm actually just surprised that he let his cue ball go forward instead of just going to the side rail and just coming back out to the middle. But over to solids now, we can see that he's going to shoot the seven ball. He's elevating again. There's a nice hard hit that I don't think was necessary. I think he could have just rolled that and almost got position on either of those three remaining solids. Looks like the six ball might be going down to the bottom left. I'm not sure I agree with this selection here. I mean, he hit it good. He's got a shot at the two ball. Probably should be going from one side to the other with a little bit of inside spin to play the eight in the same corner. Yeah, that's pretty much that. Oh, he, he overruns it, and he gets short side position. Playing on the pro side. <laughs> So yeah, another really well executed rack there. Um, I I think if anything, I have a, a couple of spots that I, I'd like to to go in more in depth on. I don't know if you've got any, Nate. Oh, I got plenty. Okay, well let's check them out. All right, so here's the first spot I want to talk about, which is a very common thing I talk about in a lot of these review videos, and that's breaking styles. Now. I actually like the way that you break, uh, even with these, uh, starting with the cue ball in the middle of the table, you get a decent spread, but there's something about this technique that I'm seeing here. If you look close enough, you can see that the tip of your cue appears to start slightly to the right of center of the cue ball. But watch closely now when I play this in slow motion, because when you actually hit the ball, here we go, right here, now, it looks like you struck the cue ball to the left of center. So I'm just going to ask, which one are you trying to do? Are you trying to do right of center, left of center, or are you actually trying to do absolute center and just get a good square hit on the one ball? So at the very least, I don't think you want to have this type of movement, let alone in your breaks, because if you're doing this in your breaks, then more than likely you're also doing this when you shoot. And that kind of goes along the lines of what Nate was talking about when you're doing the elevated shots. So you have to make sure that you're very, very accurate. So simply put, if you've ever heard of the bottle test, you failed the bottle test because you're actually going to hit the rim of the bottle when you actually try to go through the opening of the bottle. So on your breaks, let alone on your shooting, uh, when you're actually shooting a ball, try to keep this cue as straight as possible and, and just pull the cue straight back and then just launch it straight forward. And that at least should help you improve some accuracy. Would you agree with that? Uh, yeah, it's certainly not going to hurt. So, cool. That's that's all that I really had. Uh, Nate, you said you had a, uh, something you wanted to talk about? Yeah, I want to go to the 11 ball, okay. if uh, if at all possible. Well, yeah, we can do because... that right now because that was right after the break. You're talking about this yeah. spot here. So, as you can see here, he's elevated again. And, uh, I, I mean, if we actually went through this entire rack again, and maybe that's what I'll do in my next one, is I'll actually just look at all your shots and see how many of them you actually elevate on. Because, I mean, if, this was your commentary rack, so I was kind of just sitting in the background. But I couldn't help but say you're elevating again. 
you're elevating again, you're elevating again. I feel like I said that three, maybe four times and yeah. I, I bit my tongue a couple of times, but we can see here what actually elevating does. And if you actually take a look at the shot here, I mean, you can tell where his cue is lined up on the 11 ball that he's, he's undercutting the ball. I mean, you can tell that he, you can tell that he's, he's aiming right basically at the one ball and that's where he hits. But if you can, if we can actually maybe get a freeze and see if it, the cue ball's in the air again, cause he's, if we looked at the last shot, and of course on the last rack, I should say, and he was shooting the the one ball into the right middle. You can see right there that yep. the, the cue ball is clearly in the air. But the idea is we can go back from the last shot, and we saw when you're shooting the one ball, your cue ball was in the air, but it looked like it came back down onto the table and landed before the one ball. Now it's going to jump again. This is the last rack again. It's going to jump again because it's not just going to go, all right, I'm in the air. Now I'm going to go like this, right? Physics those doesn't work like that. It's going to go bounce, smaller bounce, smaller bounce, smaller bounce. Eventually, it's going to roll. But we can actually see here at this point in the at the rack that unless that cue ball is on the table when it hits the eleven ball, which I, I don't think it is. I mean, I didn't really look at this, but we're going to take a look at it here in a second. Your cue ball is actually in the air, and if you actually make contact with the ball like this. So if your cue ball is above your ball, you're not hitting it anywhere close to where you think you are. So you need to have an extra level of knowledge saying that, Hey, if my cue ball is actually above my object ball, then you actually need to cut the ball differently. You need to actually cut the ball more than what you think you do. Sorry, less than what you think you do because the ball's up above it. And if, if you, uh, here's a good experiment to do at home. Put a ball about three inches outside of the side pocket and take a ball and drop it on top of the ball at where you think you need to cut it to make it. And what you'll find out is that's actually not right. And you'll see how the balls actually interact with each other when they're coming down on them as opposed to when you're going into it. So hopefully that makes sense, but it'll give you a really good appreciation for why your ball has to be on the table or you're really starting to run into some weird issues. So let's, let's try to go through this frame by frame and see where the cue balls, and eh, you can't really tell, I guess it would be nice to be able to see if it was in the air, but you can't really do it. So uh, I guess that would, that would be for all the people that are home and they have a table available to them, maybe a room away or something like that, or maybe they're, uh, have a pool hall that they can go close, do that. Do that experiment where uh, you put a key down in front of your shot and elevate and see if you can get over that key and then drop a ball on top of a ball uh, and just see how the cut changes as the ball gets into the air. It, it'll really give you an appreciation for why you need to play this game two-dimensionally and not three-dimensionally on regular shots. It makes the game exponentially harder. So that would be my advice is we got to start working this elevations out of your game just to just to give a better level of consistency because right now you're, you're playing a game that's so hard to control well cool that was really good uh there nate the only thing i'd like to add on this particular shot um as we saw when he shot this we can tell that he must be trying to play some sort of position either on the 15 ball to go into the top left or that i think that's the 13 ball to go into the right middle so again this is t we're talking about pattern plays here because all of your work is up here. So I have to ask, when do you plan on addressing this guy? Because me personally, I do not like to have my cue ball go up and down the table if I can help it. And the thing is with the way that you're starting right now with this 11 ball, you can get position on it. And this kind of goes along with uh, Nate's comment about removing the elevation, hitting this with a leveled cue. And it would appear, because I could be wrong from the camera angle, that the cue ball can just roll its way past the 13 ball and past the seven and then get position on the 10 ball to go into the lower right corner pocket because it does look like it passes the seven ball. Once you've done that, you're done with this half of the table because you now have to return back to this uh, portion of the table here and then now your cue ball movements can be very small uh, as you go from one stripe to the other, which usually means you should have more control. I just think that smaller cue ball movements are just easier to control. Therefore, you have a higher chance at being successful. So this 11 ball here turns out to be a really key moment for this player's turn to actually just be able to run the rack. So I hope we can actually, uh, that this advice here is actually helpful for this rack. But now let's go check out your final rack. All right, so let's get started with the last rack and your advice from the beginning 
is he was lining up a little bit on the right side of the cue ball. So he kind of looks like he's doing that again. He switched cues. Uh, I'm assuming this is a break cue. But he's still, even with the break, he was lining up on the right side of the cue ball ever so slightly. So that's something that seems to be a recurring thing. It doesn't seem to be a one-off. So let's get the rack started. We've already talked about that one. Yeah, and you can see he's really on the right side there. And he finishes to the left. Yep. He at least made a ball on the break this time. Yeah, he's got a ball down this time. That's a big cluster of stripes on the right side of the table. You probably want to avoid that. That's no good. So you're going to you're gonna end up taking solids here. And the, the good part is they all look really good. Yeah, there's really no problems here. I, I, I would like to think with this guy's talent that he probably should be running out. You can see he's elevating there. So he's one for one on elevating, although, you know, he was kind of frozen to the rail there. So I'll give him a half a pass there. But I'm still counting as an elevation check because he did not need to elevate that much. Even here, you can see he's elevating his cue again. He's putting his hand up on top of the, the rail. He does not need to do that. So he's two for two on elevating. Do Chinese eight ball little... players or snooker players use rail bridge? Or do they always I have don't their know hand they, under yeah. the cue? I was going to say, I don't know if they do or not, because he elevates there again. He doesn't need to do that. He could just put the cue on the rail and use that as a as his bridge. But he, I haven't seen him use that yet. So maybe they do, maybe they don't. I'm not really sure. Hard to tell what he's doing right here. But currently, he is big, long stroke. I like the big, long stroke. But I don't know if it's necessary for all shots. So now he's got a real tester here. Just a straight high ball would get him where he needs to be. Off camera, he can't tell if he's elevating again, but it looks like he actually is with where his hand is. Oh, he gets a very fortunate kick there. So now it's just a little draw stroke back. Probably don't want to bring the 12 ball into play, so I think the draw is a better shot than going forward. That's pretty good. Pretty like good. A break a run. And you can see here he's elevated again ever so slightly. He doesn't need to be that elevation, but that's that's that light right there is nitpicking elevation. That's I'm not super worried about that, but you can see that he's elevating on most of his shots. I'd like to see him develop a rail bridge so that he doesn't have to do that so much, but we'll get into that in a, a little bit more detail here in a second once we actually start diving into the rack. All right, so even though uh, Nate uh, commentated through this rack, I'm actually going to begin with the uh, specific spots here. And this is a break and run. Like, so, like, what are you, what are you supposed to advise on, on a break and run? Well, we saw Do it how... more often. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> we saw how he had to do a what I believe to be a recovery shot uh, on the two ball. That's what allowed him to break and run the rack because of how he played the four ball. And with the position that he got on the four ball from this shot here, because when he played the seven... He gets this position on the four, and that's why he ends up having to make a recovery shot. Because here, I don't like this particular angle, because the natural angle actually takes the cue ball over to the four stripes and even to the eight ball. So he had to have put uh, checked this with some inside spin to actually cause it to go in between the two and the eight and come all the way down over by the 12 ball to actually make that recovery shot on the two ball. So the only thing I can suggest here is instead of allowing the cue ball to roll, stop the cue ball or maybe even draw the cue ball a little bit. So that way you're sitting around this area here to give you some sort of an angle to do one of two things, depending upon how specific the angle is. You can either play the four in to the corner pocket still and stun down for the two to go into the right middle, get position on the five and then get position on the eight. Or if you're too straight, you just draw straight back and you have multiple options, depending upon if you stop here, the two goes into the lower left. If it stops here, the two goes into the right, or I'm sorry, the left middle. Or you still play the five and maybe use the two to go into the upper left, which turns out to be a real good key shot to get position on the eight. So again, another pattern type of play. And I just think this pattern is easier because you're not having to make a recovery shot. Nate, what would you think of that? Uh, I like it. Uh, I think uh, going back to the beginning of the rack, the hardest ball on the table is going to be your four ball because the 13 ball and the nine ball are both kind of funneling. Uh, I don't know if maybe, maybe funneling your cue ball in there. I mean, it, it, there's really not a great way to get 
into that cluster and out of it without disturbing anything. And you, with the rack this wide open from the beginning, you don't want to be moving anything on the table because everything already goes. So don't risk it. So I, I really like trying to get very, very straight on the four ball. He actually looks like he might have a chance at it right now. I'm not sure if the eight ball covers it up or now, but if, if he can get to it right now, he's got a very straight angle on it. He could pull the cue ball back just a little bit, take a seven ball into the right middle pocket. He could take the two ball in between the five and the 12 ball with just a stop shot. I mean, it's a long shot, so I don't think you really want to take that on. But if you can get to the four ball immediately on this rack, do it because the seven ball really isn't that scary. It goes into the right middle. It goes into the left middle. It goes into both of the bottom corners and it goes into the top left as long as the four ball's gone. I mean, it's definitely the second most scary shot on the table. So you, you don't want to leave it behind for forever, but the four balls really where you want to put most of your effort on this rack. Cause that's really the only way that you're going to get stopped from running out on this rack. And it almost did, as we saw, I mean, he had to make a really good recovery shot on the two ball that you talked about already just to give him a chance at running out of this rack still. So the four ball didn't get you this time. But if you play, if I mean, if you just set up those last three balls after the seven ball and you shoot it 10 times, I don't think you're going to run out of it more than 50% of the time. I think you're actually, a, I think you're actually a dog to get, to get out of that rack from here. You did it. So that's good. We only see three racks. Maybe, maybe you're a lot better than what the, the first two racks showed. And maybe this is your true game right here. But when you have to start making hero shots like that, it's, it's not a position you want to put your game in. just, just play the correct patterns, get the, get the trouble balls out of the way as soon as you possibly can. And trust that uh, with the problem balls out of the, out of the way that you can tic-tac-toe the rest of the rack from there. <laughs> tic-tac-toe. I, I like it. <laughs> uh, Nate, is there anything else on this uh, rack you want to mention? Well, I, I want to talk a little bit. I want to tie into this kind of the the broad thing that I want to say about your game. You seem to be, uh, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce your name. I, I'll just say Lee because uh, that was easy. Uh, <laughs> you seem to be a pretty good cueist. We, we can see that you're holding a snooker cue. I think you're a snooker player. And because of that, I'm going to I'm going to like tell you my ignorance right here. I don't know the game of snooker very well. I've played it a couple times. I know that my high run is two. <laughs> it's a really hard game. It's not even possible to run a two, but I ran a two and that's good enough for me. Actually, it is. I guess I suppose you can get all the reds out of the way and just make the yellow. But anyways, uh, is it the yellow or the green first? Here, here's my ignorance of snooker. I, I love the game, but I, I don't know the game all that well. I do know, however, that there are shots that exist in snooker and there are shots that exist in nine ball that are completely unique to that game. The closed bridge is a great example. You'll never see a snooker player use a closed bridge. It's an accuracy game and having a big old fat finger in the way of your cueing is not going to do you any good when you have to be 110% accurate on every single shot. So that is one thing that exists in nine ball pool that doesn't exist in snooker. And what I'm seeing, and I might be wrong here, but a rail shot might not be a shot that exists in snooker that also exists in nine ball pool. But if you're going to play nine ball pool, you can get by without using the closed bridge, but you can't, you just can't play this game at a top level without a rail bridge. And I think you really, really do need to develop one of those. You might want to develop a closed bridge, but the point really that I want to talk about here is you're playing snooker as a nine ball player, or yeah, I'm using nine ball is like uh, the generic term for pocket billiards, which is, you know, this game, eight ball. Um, you got to have certain shots that don't exist in snooker and you got to develop those. So right here, you should be using a rail bridge. You should be putting that cue on the table. Well, we'll do this. The cue should be on the table like this. You should have two fingers over the top of it like this, and you should be stroking the cue back and forth on the table. Because if you if you bridge up like this, the only thing that you can do is elevate to get yourself into the cue ball. You don't need to do that as much if you're just using a rail bridge. So my advice is, you know, watch some pros, watch some amateurs, do whatever you need to do, but develop yourself the shots needed to succeed at this game. If you're going to play this game in any sort of depth and the rail bridge is the most important one, I would say. Closed bridge, you can mess around with, decide if it's the right, uh, you know, a good bridge for you, but you don't really need that. Uh, but the rail bridge, I think you absolutely do to have a lot of success at this game. So that's my advice is I'm assuming if you're, if you're sending this video into Lil Chris that you, you're, you're looking to play some more nine ball, eight ball, uh, this style of uh, queuing. So 
learn the game, play the game. And the snooker shots don't, you know, the snooker snooker is a different game. It's a better game. In my opinion, I think the game is beautiful, I would agree. but they, they, they definitely require different aspects on the game. So if you're going to play eight ball, uh, eight ball pool, I think you need to start playing the shots that are necessary to succeed at this game at a high level. So that's my advice is just, you know, jump, d- dive in a little deeper, learn the game a little bit better, uh, learn the, learn the, the bridges, the, um, the pattern, stuff like that to help you really succeed at this game more. Well, I think that's just pretty much going to wrap up uh, this video here. Uh, Daron, uh, to kind of piggyback off of what Nate was saying, your game is solid. Like I said, it, whether it's whether it's you're a Chinese eight ball player or you're a snooker player, like you you have the mechanics to play those games. But I do have you're to solid agree with, Yeah, but I do have to agree with Nate as far as playing eight ball or nine ball, or should I just categorize it as American pool? Um, of some sort, or pocket billiards, uh, nonetheless. That there, there, there are just different types of mechanics uh, that I think you can just have in your game as well to play this game on top of having your Chinese eight ball or your schnooker mechanics to go along with it. Because just the more weapons you have in your arsenal, the the more dangerous you are. So, with the very least, that's why you didn't really see us nitpick anything about your mechanics, with the exception of your break. Um, like I said, starting at the right of center of the cue ball, but then actually somehow striking to the left of center really is indicative of not having a straight stroke. Uh, so if you're doing that on your break, you're definitely probably doing it on your shots, um, which is just going to decrease your accuracy. Uh, so I would I would probably mainly emphasize on that. Uh, besides that, the only thing I can hope for is that the advice that I gave and Nate gave, you do find helpful. Uh, so that way you can hopefully try to incorporate this stuff into your game and of course improve. So, yep. Nate, I want to thank you for joining me for another episode here for uh, some coaching lessons. Uh, feel free to give some sort of plug for the uh, the Cue It Up Network as we wrap this up. Yeah, I mean, if you if you didn't uh, if you didn't guide your gouge your ears out from listening to me talk for the last thirty minutes, and somehow you hate your life enough to want to hear more of it, I do have a podcast. It is the Cue It Up uh, Network. Uh, Cue it up a billiards podcast. You can find me on all of the major forums. We talk about everything that's happening in the world of pool. So if you are a Q nut and all you want to do is consume more pool and billiards and snooker in your life, we have your fix. We bring on the top players, the top promoters, the top industry leaders. We talk to them about what they're doing, uh, how they're doing it, why they're doing it. And we really just dive you know, super deep into all aspects of pool because we're pool nuts and we try to keep it light. We try to have a little bit of fun with it. Uh, try to have a laugh or two every now and then. And yeah, we're just, uh, we're trying to grow this game that we all love so much and we're submitting videos for to uh, try to better our own game. So that's, uh, that's kind of what we're doing over there. We got a big crew of people. Like I said at the beginning of the video, we're going to have Albin Ocean on on Monday. We're also going to have Alex Kazakis very soon, Emily Frazier. We're going to be having the Iceman, Mika Eminen. Uh, We've had a bunch of people in the past. I'm trying to get Shane on. Shane's a a bit of a loose friend of mine, so I'm trying to get him onto the podcast. He's he's not the most social person in the world, so I'll uh, I'll keep on him and I'll see if I can get him on the podcast. But, uh, you know, everybody loves Shane Ben Boning, of course. But uh, yeah, so that's what we're doing. And uh, if, if you want some more content, uh, check out Cue It Up Network on Facebook page. And I, I'm pretty sure I'm like six people away from a thousand subscribers on YouTube. And I basically never promote this because I don't really care that much. I don't, I, I upload a lot of stuff to there. I think I have like well over a hundred videos, but for whatever reason, I've been at 990 for how long has it been now, Chris? It's been a couple of months. It, it's been at least a couple of months. And I, I just want to get to a thousand so that I can start making money off of all you chumps that watch this stupid show. <laughs> God, that would be fantastic. Oh. So if you hate your life enough to want to subscribe to a perfectly mediocre average YouTube channel, please hook a brother up. <laughs> well, I tell you what, Nate, I could try to help you out with that. I'll be sure to leave a link in the description box of this video here. <laughs> <laughs> the Cue It Up Network on Facebook and to the Cue It Up uh, Billiard Podcast on YouTube. So like I said, Nate, thanks for being here. Taron, good luck in your game. And I hope the advice uh, that we gave was helpful enough to do that for you. 
As for yeah, you're a great else. QS man. Just, just, just keep playing the game. I, I, I know sometimes it sounds like we're being really critical, and uh, I guess that's kind of the point of doing this, right? Is uh, it's to be critical and to give you guys something to work towards because the things that we talk about. I mean, a lot of people make these things. It sounds like we're being overly critical, but we're, we, we really want to see the best for you guys, uh, and that's why we're trying to help you out. So uh, you're a great QS. Keep up the great work. Uh, yeah, I'd love to be love to be bringing you onto the podcast someday because you're a top player and you're winning the world championships. That'd be fantastic. <laughs> there you go. And I actually did almost forget because I always like to include you, the viewers, um, in these uh, lessons as well. So clearly, if you saw something that Nate and I did not see, then feel free to leave a comment in the comment section below with a timestamp of whatever shot that you want to give for some type of advice, uh, maybe a, a fix in his form or fundamentals, or maybe even a different shot pattern than what uh, Nate and I actually did. Besides all that, thanks everybody for watching this video and take care. Thanks guys. See you later.